you're a carnivore heart surgeon. I'm a high fat carnivore just in general. When we do carnivore diet or a keto diet, why does our cholesterol increase and our LDL increase in some people? Yeah. So, and it's key what you said at the end, in some people, um, the studies actually show, uh, you know, when you take a large population of people doing low carb diets, uh, on average, over the long term, the LDL actually doesn't change significantly, but there's a subset of people that have, you know, what's been called a hyper response uh, and the LDL increases. Um, it, it seems to have to do with the best explanation I've come across so far is really the one that was, you know, put forth by uh, Dave Feldman in his work, the lipid energy model, um, that when you're switching to this ketogenic metabolism and your body is using fat for energy, that fat needs to be trafficked through the bloodstream in increased amounts. And LDL cholesterol is, you know, the primary way that our body accomplishes that. And that seems to be why the LDL goes up. Now, what's important is in the vast majority of cases uh, of people that have this increased LDL, this hyper response, when you do that advanced testing, what you see is it's the large particles that have increased. It's not the small particles that have increased. And that, that explains why it doesn't seem to be problematic. Okay. So can you just um, tell us that test for the particle size that every person needs to order before they freak out about the LDL? What's the name to know those particle sizes? Yeah. Like I said, again, it's that NMR or advanced lipid panel. And, you know, there's a little bit of a caveat here. Uh, outside of the United States, uh, it can be difficult to get this test done. Uh, we, we have international clients in our uh, practice, and in a lot of countries, it's very difficult to get that test. Uh, so one of the other things we can talk about is some other tests that you can look at to at least give you an indicator as to whether or not, you know, your LDL cholesterol particles are likely to be problematic or not. If you can get the test, great. I think that's the best way to do it. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is a lot of people can't get the test. And there are some other things that we can start to look at to help us try and figure out if, you know, the uh, if the lipids are likely to be problematic or not. Okay, let's talk about those tests. I'm very, very curious because I'm not in the US. I'm sure that many of my audience, some people live in the US, some people don't, but it's also good to have these tests handy to understand if you can't get the particle test done, other tests that you might want to do. Can you list those tests, please? Yeah, so you ultimately want to figure out uh, if you have inflammation and if you have insulin resistance. And if you have neither of those things, it's very good chances that your LDL is not going to be the problematic kind of LDL. Uh, so on the in inflammation side of things, the most common test I see and I recommend is what's called a C-reactive protein, CRP. Sometimes you'll see it called high sensitivity CRP or HSCRP. Uh, and that's kind of a general body inflammation marker. And uh, we want to keep that, you know, uh, and again, it might vary where you are, different units and stuff. But here in the U.S., what we tell people is you want to keep it less than one. Uh, ideally, over three is definitely problematic. One to three is a little bit of a gray zone, but ideally we want to keep this less than one. Uh, there are some other inflammation markers we can look at. We can look at things like uh, ferritin, which is a uh, indicator of inflammation, but also relates to your iron stores. So that one can be a little tricky sometimes. Uh, we have things like uh, there's something called an ESR, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It's another inflammation that you'll see uh, uh, used. Uh, some places you might see something like an IL-6, interleukin-6, used as an inflammation marker. Uh, and then uric acid. Um, uric acid, many doctors think of that in the context of gout, um, but uric acid is actually a, a decent overall inflammation marker, and we can use that as an indicator as well. 
So lots of options on inflammation. Uh, but like I said, CRP is probably the most common one that people are going to get. Okay. The ferritin is quite interesting because I've seen some carnivals on our Go Carnival community uh, that says that say my ferritin has really increased when I'm doing carnival. Why might that be? And also, what is the level that ferritin should be to show that you're not you don't have the inflammation. Yeah. So again, ferritin is one uh, is basically a storage form of iron in our body. So ferritin is going to be affected by how much iron you have in your body, how much iron you're eating, and you know, in a meat heavy diet, that may rise. Uh, but ferritin is also affected by inflammation, and this is why interpreting ferritin can get a little tricky. Um, when ferritin is elevated because of inflammation, it's problematic. Uh, when ferritin is elevated because your body is not processing iron correctly, uh, there's a disease called hemochromatosis, uh, where the body doesn't process iron properly and ferritin goes up and that's problematic. That disease has been associated with heart disease. Um, however, if your ferritin is elevated because you're eating a meat-heavy diet and you don't have one of those other things, I don't think it's problematic. And I, and I also see this in uh, a fair number of my patients. And this is the reason that we check multiple inflammation markers, right? So we can get an overall picture and we're not relying on just one number. So for instance, if I have someone that their C-reactive protein is normal, and maybe their uric acid is normal, and uh, you know other inflammation markers are normal, and the ferritin is elevated, and they're on a meat-heavy diet, I'm not going to be uh, necessarily concerned about that. And um, you know th this kind of talks to the complexity of blood work, right? And this is why it it's not always easy to interpret this yourself. There's a lot of nuance with a lot of these labs. Um, and, you know, going back to how we started the conversation, this is what I think is so, you know, silly or ironic uh, about LDL cholesterol that most doctors have been sort of brainwashed into thinking that it is the end all and be all and that we can reduce our health to this one number when we know that these systems are so complex and there really isn't you know, one thing, one number that can be taken in isolation uh, that tells us, you know, everything about our health. We always need to be interpreting the total picture uh, when it comes to blood work and when it comes to the to the human being in front of us. That's one of the great things about you. You know, it's really hard to find a heart doctor or a heart surgeon that also understands a ketogenic carnival lifestyle. Uh, even under getting a doctor that understands carnival is quite interesting. So given that you see patients, heart patients, do you ever recommend a statin? Is there a place for statins with your patients? Yeah, the place that I recommend statins is if I have someone that is, in, you know, insulin resistant, does have inflammation, uh, and their LDL cholesterol is high, and they don't want to do anything about the inflammation and the insulin resistance, you know, they're not willing to go on a low carb carnivore diet or make the lifestyle changes. In that situation, there is a small benefit to taking statins. Uh, and what I help people to understand is that benefit is quite small. It's not this massive benefit that most doctors think it is. And there's a trade off over the long run uh, and possibly in the short term, right? Statins, like every medication, they have side effects that we have to be concerned about. Um, but like I said, if you're not going to do, you know, what needs to be done to address these other factors, then in that situation, it makes it may make sense to take a statin. Uh, you just have to understand that it's not really solving your problem. What are the side effects that we're talking about here? Because personally, some members of my family they take a statin. If they can hear from you, a cardiac heart surgeon, what are some side effects long-term for people that don't change their diet, but they take a statin? Yeah. So the two biggest long-term effects I worry about with statins, uh, number one is that they increase insulin resistance. And, you know, insulin resistance is the root cause of heart disease. 
So we're taking care of this cholesterol that, you know, plays a part in the uh, heart disease process, but we're actually worsening, you know, a primary driver of the disease process. And that's why I think the benefit is so small with statins, because you're making one thing a little bit better, but you're making another thing uh, worse. Uh, so that's top of my list reason that I'm not a big fan of statins. Uh, the second problem that I see with long-term use is the memory issues uh, and the neurocognitive issues that come up with long-term statin use. And the other reason that I think statin use is so problematic is, again, because it gives people this false sense of security. It gives the patients and the doctors this false sense of security that they're taking care of the heart disease and that they're not going to get heart disease. And the unfortunate reality is uh, today, the majority of the patients that end up on my operating table are on these medications and have been on these medications for years, and yet they still end up with the heart disease. So that's really why uh, I am so critical of statins is because they've given this false impression uh, of fixing the problem when they're not. Um, you know, a, a, a story for you, when I was going through my training as a surgeon and I was deciding what, you know, area of surgery I wanted to specialize in, uh, and this is early 2000s, and I, you know, was talking to my mentors that I was really interested in heart surgery. I found it, you know, interesting and uh, I like that area. Uh, and they all told me, don't go into heart surgery. There's going to be nothing for you to do in 15, 20 years because we have the answer to heart disease. You know, statins at this time were the most uh, widely prescribed class of medications. And it was felt that we were going to eliminate heart disease. Well, here we are, you know, 20 plus years later, I'm busier than ever as a heart surgeon. There's actually a shortage of heart surgeons in the United States. There aren't enough heart surgeons to do the surgery that needs to be done. And heart disease, like we said earlier, is still far and away the number one killer. Is heart disease preventable? I definitely think it's preventable. You know, the way that I look at things uh, these days, the people that end up on my operating table, uh, each one of them is a failure. But it's not that that person has failed. It's that the medical system has failed them because heart disease should not get to that advanced stage where you need me to open up your chest and, and do this, uh, it, you know, very invasive surgery. And it really shouldn't get to the stage where you even need stents or anything like that. Um, we know what is causing heart disease. We know how to reverse the cause of heart disease. And therefore, it's really inexcusable uh, that we still continue to have heart disease uh, to the magnitude that we have it. You know, it's still the number one killer here in the United States. It's the number one killer worldwide. And it really shouldn't be that way. And that's, you know, why I'm on the mission that I'm on, uh, to keep people off the operating table, to keep them from needing heart disease, to, from having heart disease and needing that surgery. 